A buzzing of electricity was heard through a pair of old headphones as the men awaited to see if their creation had worked. Suddenly through the line, a sing-song of dits and daws flooded into their ears and they erupted in cheers. It had worked. Communications between Europe and the North American continent were forever changed, bringing humanity into their next era. None of this could have been possible without one revolutionary ship, the Great Eastern herself. Welcome to Fast Facts Friday, my name is Eleanor. Just a quick disclaimer for a younger audience before we dive in. This story may be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Okay everyone, let's get into it. Today we get into the second transatlantic telegraph cable laid by SS Great Eastern in the 1860s. If you're wondering why we are skipping to the second, let me give you a short background on the first cable. The first transatlantic telegraph cable, which would allow easier telegraph communications between Europe and America, was poorly constructed, and shortly after it was laid in 1858, it failed due to progressive deterioration of the insulation. The cable was never put in service for public use and never worked well, but there was time for a few messages to be passed that went beyond testing. For example, the collision between the Cunard line ships Europa and Arabia was reported on August 17, 1858 prior to the cable's failure, and a total of 732 messages were passed before the cable ultimately went kaput. But that's the first cable, the second one is the one I'm excited about. Businessman and financier Cyrus West Field, who'd been heavily involved with the first cable, was undaunted by the first cable's failure. He was eager to try again, but the public had since lost confidence in the scheme, and his efforts to revive the company were futile. It was not until 1864 that, with the assistance of Thomas Brassey and John Pender, he succeeded in raising the necessary funds for the venture. The Glass, Elliott, and Gouda Percha companies were united to form the Telegraph Construction Maintenance Company, or Telcon, later part of British Insulated Calendars Cables, or BIC, which undertook the manufacture and laying of the new cable. C.F. Varley replaced Wildman Whitehouse as chief electrician, who'd been the chief engineer and a key player in the first cable's failure. In the meantime, long cables had been submerged in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. With this experience, an improved cable was designed to cross the Atlantic. The core consisted of seven twisted strands of very pure copper weighing 300 pounds per nautical mile, coated with Chatterton's compound, which is an adhesive waterproof insulating compound that was used in early submarine telegraph cables, then covered with four layers of gutta percha, which is a tree that is primarily used to create a high-quality latex of the same name, alternating with four thin layers of the compound cementing the hole, and bringing the weight of this insulator to 400 pounds per nautical mile. This core was covered with hemp saturated in a preservative solution, and on the hemp were helically wound 18 single strands of high tensile steel wire produced by Webster and Horsfall Limited of Hay Mills, Birmingham, each covered with fine strands of manila yarn steeped in a preservative. The weight of the new cable was 35.75 long hundredweight, or 4,000 pounds per nautical mile, or nearly twice the weight of the old cable. The Haymills site successfully manufactured 26,000 miles, or 1,600 tons of wire, made by 250 workers over the span of 11 months. This was in the 1860s, which was long before automated machinery and factories, so this cable was made by hand in a painstaking process. The cable was wound, and next it would be loaded onto the Great Eastern. If you are enjoying this episode and want to hear more about ships, their careers, and their wrecks, check out our main show, Shipwreck Sunday, every Sunday night at 4pm Pacific Standard Time. Alright, let's look at the laying of the second transatlantic telegraph cable and Great Eastern's role in it. SS Great Eastern, our next key player in the story, is the subject of this Sunday's episode, but what you need to know about her at this moment is that she was so unique for her time, and so far before her time it wasn't even funny. The level of innovation and creativity that went into her creation is insurmountable. To think a ship would be equipped with sails, steam-powered paddle wheels, and steam-powered propeller engines in the 1850s is just bonkers to think about. The ship was the largest of her time by far, being an absolute behemoth. Unfortunately, the building of this ship was difficult and faced numerous setbacks, and the hype around it just wasn't what it should have been, so she's considered a massive failure. One of my favorite failures of all time, however, and the Great Babe as she was called, walked so later behemoths could run. 
Well, she would get her moment of fame, and it was with the second transatlantic telegraph cable. The new cable was to be laid by the Great Babe, captained by Sir James Anderson. Her immense hull was fitted with three iron tanks for the reception of 2,300 nautical miles of cable, and her decks furnished with the paying out gear to lay it. At noon on July 15, 1865, Great Eastern left Norre for Folhomeren Bay, Valencia Island, where the shore end was laid by Caroline. This attempt failed on August 2nd when, after 1,062 nautical miles had been paid out, the cable snapped near the stern end of the ship, and the end was lost. I'd be uttering some curse words for certain if I'd been a part of the paying out and saw that cable snap. Great Eastern steamed back to England, where Field issued another prospectus and formed the Anglo-American Telegraph Company to lay a new cable and complete the broken one. A year later, on July 13, 1866, Great Eastern started paying out once more. Despite problems with the weather on the evening of Friday, July 27, the expedition reached the port of Hearts Content, Newfoundland, in a thick fog. Daniel Gooch, chief engineering of the Telegraph Construction and Maintenance Company, who had been aboard the Great Eastern, sent a message to the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Lord Stanley, saying, quote, Perfect communication established between England and America. God grant it will be a lasting source of benefit to our country. The next morning at 9 a.m., a message from England cited these words from the leader, in other words, editorial, in the Times, quote, it is a great work, a glory to our age and nation, and the men who have achieved it deserve to be honored among the benefactors of their race. The shore end was landed at Hearts Content Cable Station during the day by Medway. Congratulations poured in, and friendly telegrams were again exchanged between Queen Victoria and the United States. In August of 1866, several ships, including Great Eastern, were put to sea again in order to grapple the lost cable of 1865. Their goal was to find the end of the lost cable, splice it to a new cable, and complete the run to Newfoundland. They were determined to find it, and their search was based solely upon positions recorded, quote, principally by Captain Moriarty R.N., who placed the end of the lost cable at longitude 38 degrees 50 minutes west. Of course, there were some who thought it was hopeless to try, declaring that trying to locate a cable 2.5 miles down would be like looking for a small needle in a very large haystack. However, Robert Halpin, first officer of the Great Eastern, navigated HMS Terrible and grappling ship Albany to the correct location. Albany moved slowly back and forth, fishing for the lost cable with a five-pronged grappling hook at the end of a stout rope. Yes, it was this precise. Suddenly, on August 10th, Albany caught the fish she was looking for, hooking onto the cable and bringing it to the surface. It seemed so stupidly easy to find this thing, but during the night, the cable slipped from the buoy to which it had been secured, and the process had to begin again. This happened several more times, with the cable slipping after being secured in a frustrating battle with rough seas. One time, a sailor was even flung across the deck when the grapnel rope snapped and recoiled around him. Great Eastern and another grappling ship, Medway, arrived to join the search on August 12th. It wasn't until 14 days later, in early September 1866, that the cable was carried to the electrician's room, where it was determined that the cable was connected. All on the ship cheered or wept as rockets were sent up into the sky to light the sea in celebration. The recovered cable was then spliced to a fresh cable in her hold and paid out to Heart's Content, where she arrived on Saturday, September 7th. Now there were two working telegraph lines. We glossed over the repair process, but I promise you it was not easy. Broken cables required an elaborate repair procedure. The approximate distance to the break was determined by measuring the resistance of the broken cable. The repair shop navigated to the location. The cable was then hooked with a grapple and brought on board to test for electrical continuity. Buoys were also deployed to mark the ends of a good cable, and a splice was made between the two ends. Remember, this was done before the luxury of high-powered machinery, so this was primarily done by hand. Like dial-up internet, connection speeds left much to be desired. Initially, messages were sent by an operator using Morse code. The reception was very bad on the 1858 cable, and it took two minutes to transmit just one character, a single letter or a single number, a rate of about 0.1 words per minute. That just sucks, honestly. This was despite the use of the highly sensitive mirror galvanometer. The inaugural message from Queen Victoria took 67 minutes to transmit to Newfoundland, but it took 16 hours for the confirmation copy to be transmitted back to White House in Valencia. For the 1866 cable, the methods of cable manufacture as well as sending messages had been vastly improved. 
1866 cable could transmit 8 words a minute, 80 times faster than the 1858 cable. Oliver Heaviside and Mihailo Idvorsky Pupin in later decades understood that the bandwidth of a cable is hindered by an imbalance between capacitive and inductive reactants, which causes a severe dispersion and hence a signal distortion. This has to be solved by iron tape or by load coils. It was not until the 20th century that message transmission speeds over transatlantic cables would even reach 120 words per minute. London became the world's center in telecommunications. Eventually, no fewer than 11 cables radiated from Port Curnow Cable Station near Land's End and formed with their Commonwealth links a live girdle around the world, called the All Red Line. Additional cables were laid between Foyle Hummerin and Hearts Content in 1873, 1874, 1880, and 1894. By the end of the 19th century, British, French, German, and American-owned cables linked Europe and North America in a sophisticated web of telegraphic communications. The original cables were not fitted with repeaters, which potentially could completely solve the retardation problem and consequently speed up operation. Repeaters amplify the signal periodically along the line. On telegraph lines, this is done with relays, but there was no practical way to power them in a submarine cable. The first transatlantic cable with repeaters was TAT-1 in 1956. This was a telephone cable and used a different technology for its repeaters. A 2018 study in the American Economic Review found that the transatlantic telegraph substantially increased trade over the Atlantic and reduced prices. The study estimates that efficiency gains due to the establishment of the telegraph connection amounted to 8% of export value. Nowadays, telegraphy is a largely obsolete form of communication, and the cables have long since been decommissioned, but telephone and data are still carried on other transatlantic telecommunications cables to this day, including for internet communications. Despite this cable being long forgotten, it was advantageous for technological advancement, and it was a massive achievement for the Great Eastern. The ocean liner was a breathtaking work of art, far before her time, and the beloved great babe to her designer. She was to be the peak of innovation, even laying the transatlantic telegraph cable. Unfortunately for this beautiful ship, the world just wasn't ready for her, and life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. This Sunday on Shipwreck Sunday, we get into the Great Eastern.